the taste of Lent is so good, isn't it? Oh, we have a new appreciation for it. Welcome, everybody, to our second conversation on uh, what we're calling community conversations on race and racism. Um, tonight, of course, is session two, and uh, we have framed uh, this evening to speaking of where are we? Um, and Omar is going to come in a little bit and talk a little bit more about that and help frame that discussion a little bit tonight. But basically, we're just looking to understand, looking to listen to one another and how we respond to and serve as the body of Christ uh, in today's cultural reality, uh, which is a challenge. And we want to be biblically inspired and Holy Spirit equipped, amen, to do that work uh, in this world today. So tonight will hopefully uh, be an inspiration and encouragement and equipping time for all of us to lean into that. So what I'm going to do is uh, open us with prayer and uh, welcome you guys to Community United Methodist Church. Um, you, uh, if you need to use the restrooms, which is always a big question, right? Um, uh, the ladies' room and the men's room just come in out, out, out the same door you came in and they're just right around the corner there to the left. So let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Gracious God, as we meet together in this house, your house, as we meet together, Lord, with brothers and sisters in Christ and leaders of our community and your people, Lord, gathered together as one, we simply seek your counsel. We seek your wisdom. We seek your presence. And we pray that you might open our eyes and open our ears and open our hearts to one another. Help us to understand where we do not. Help us, Lord God, to learn where we are ignorant. Help us, Lord God, to truly be equipped in this time tonight by the conversation that goes on and by the, Lord God, uh, common wisdom and, and experiences and knowledge that will be shared amongst our panelists and those who will be, uh, Lord, responding online. We pray in everything that your name will be glorified and that we might be, Lord God, better ready to serve our community and to be people who build bridges, bridges of peace, bridges of unity, and bridges, Lord God, of reconciliation. This is our prayer for tonight. So come, Holy Spirit, and dwell in this place. This is your meeting, and we just ask you to, Lord, move in every bit of our speech, our hearts, our conversation, that we might be lifted up as we lift you up and as we understand one another better. For this we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let all God's people say, Amen. I'm going to ask Andy to go on and come forward and uh, lift up tonight some of the challenges as we are talking about the very subject of racism. Thank you, Ted, and thank you, community, for hosting us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us online. So last time we met, two weeks ago, we were very blessed that as we looked back at the viewing numbers, we had over 900 people view our conversation, which is phenomenal because it says this is something that people want to learn how to tackle, how to engage, and we're really grateful for that. However, one thing we found was that if you have 900 people watching something, there is going to be a disagreement. And so we just want to take a minute before we start to acknowledge that and to say that we're all coming to this table, we're all looking at this issue from different perspectives. There are some hard conversations, there are difficult conversations, and it's really easy when we hear someone say something that we disagree with that we kind of get on the defensive and we fight back. We want to challenge you as the churches in our community today to, to adopt a different posture. One of humility. One of seeking to understand. One of acknowledging that none of us come to the table with all the answers. So we would invite you as you listen today, as you partake, as you watch online, to adopt the, the posture as David did. When he said, search me, O God, and know my heart, what we're asking today through these conversations is not that our panelists speak to us and give us some magic pill that fixes everything, but that God would speak to us and shape our hearts and make us more like him, fit to serve in his kingdom. Having said that, the scripture always has a bent to encourage us to hear from the marginalized 
and from the vulnerable and from those who have been abused. So as we gather today, we are going to side and listen and learn from those who have been victims of the racism and injustice in our society. I've been reading a fantastic book um, over the last few weeks. I've challenged myself to learn more about this topic. And, and one of them that I'm reading right now is called uh, Rediscipling the White Church. And the summary that the author is leading to is that the white church, as with all churches, needs to make better disciples. So as you listen today, as you engage, as you ask questions, as you think through things, ask yourself the question, how can I become a better, more faithful disciple of Jesus in this issue of race and reconciliation. So I just want to say your perspective may be different from some of the perspectives that you hear today, and that's okay. Because we're here to listen and to learn and to model civil conversation to a world that seems to have forgotten that. So as we move forward, uh, helping to clarify where we are today, I'd like to invite Omar to come, and he is going to um, provide an update on where we are uh, today as a nation, as a society, in this issue of race and injustice. Omar, thank you so much for being here, and thanks for sharing with us. Thank you, Andy. I appreciate it. I, I want to say um, family here uh, and family that are online. Your thoughts and feelings are welcome. Um, we also encourage you to put those in, in, in the chat box because we'll be using those as we plan for our third session. As we were looking over our first session, one of the things that we noticed was um, that terms vary um, or people's thought about terms vary. So I want to clarify that because not only do I present on it, not only am I a part of a committee that's related to race and disparities, but I think it's important because even I, as many years as I've been doing it, uh, I find myself reverting back to old terms or what I believe is the right term. So when we think about where we're at here and now, we think about what is going on that causes us to, to ponder about race, about reconciliation. Uh, and one of the things we notice is that uh, things are happening today and even as I look at it, one of the encouraging things are, is, is that we're all talking more than we ever talked about it before. I encourage when you engage other folks about conversations about race, that you think about, um, you set a pact that you will honor each, other, each other's thoughts and feelings. Because that's probably the most important thing that you share perspectives, but you honor those perspectives that you hear. I was engaged in a Facebook chat with a friend of mine, and this friend of mine, we served in the military uh, together, and we had totally different views about race and how we looked at it, and at the end of the day, I had to revert to the fact that this was a person I served with that I really cared about and still really care about today. So regardless of what his thoughts are, that's what I got to hang on. So I got to value what he thinks. I got to value what it means because that's, as Andy said, is his perspective. And I, I owe him that much to honor that perspective. So when we think about definitions, the first one I want to share with you, and I'm only going to share with you a few of them because there are many definitions related to race um, and how we view race. But there's probably three of them that I want to share with you. And the first one I want to share with you is called implicit bias. Now, implicit bias is an unconscious, positive or negative mental attitude toward a person, an object, or group. There's new science that shows us that we all have implicit bias because implicit bias is based on our history. It's also based on not only our own personal history, history that we hear from others, vicarious uh, history, things that other people experience and they share with us through thoughts, feelings, and stories. 
These unconscious bias or behaviors can dictate how we respond, um, whether we want to respond that way or not. So they have control over us, even more so than the next definition I'll talk about in a second. Meaning that even based on my stated beliefs, what I tell you I believe in, there is an unconscious bias that may be totally different, okay? And again, I remind you that we all have biases. That's who we are. That makes us unique in how we operate in this space. So an explicit bias is that belief or attitude that a person endorses on a conscious level, meaning I know, so therefore I do, okay? So... The final, well, there's actually two more I want to uh, share with you. But this one is called racism. Racism is a prejudice, a discrimination, antagonism um, directed against a person or people on the basis of their membership in a particular racial or ethnic group. Typically, that group is marginalized. Typically, that's the minority group. And oftentimes, people who display racism see themselves as superior or see the other person as inferior, okay? So then the last one I want to share with you, let me back up a little bit, because we often get two of these terms, we think that they're interchangeable and they're not. We think implicit bias is interchangeable with racism. And oftentimes, I, I had this conversation with my wife and I asked her a question. I said, um, can you have a racist statement or racist meme posted on Facebook or Instagram, wherever you may put it, and you be racist. And that automatically, because of that post, because of that meme, because of what you say, does that automatically make you a racist? By definition, I want to share with you that does not, okay? That could be a bias. That can be, and oftentimes that's an implicit bias. Because bias means, especially implicit bias, means you're unaware that you operate in that space. So oftentimes we look at a person just because we see a post and we automatically get angry, upset, and we wonder why that person who we care about expressed that view. And oftentimes it's because of who they hang out with that they never had the exposure that we had. Remember, like I said, bias is based on our history, how we expose ourselves to certain people. So we have to be conscious about that and not... Um, cancel our friendship with someone just because of the fact that they share something differently uh, than we expect from them, okay? They have a saying that expectations are failures waiting to happen. So the, the last um, definition I want to share with you is called structural racism. They often call it institutional racism as well. That's when the, the system itself normalized or legitimized an array of dynamics these dynamics can be historical, cultural, institutional, interpersonal, that routinely advantages one population while it chronically and cumulatively disadvantages another population. Often we, when we talk about those two populations, we're talking about blacks and we're talking about whites. So those are the terms we want to operate in this space when we're thinking about it because, again, oftentimes we think that a person is displaying something, but they're actually haven't been around a certain um, mode of folks to really grasp what that actually is doing to them, so to speak. Because oftentimes that bias, because you don't know what, that you're operating in that space, can damage your reputation and you not even know about it. You know, so the more we have conversations like this, the more we socialize with people who are outside of our normal type of people that we would socialize with, the more we can engage in conversations like this, and I, that's, like, that's the reason why I say it's okay to share your feelings online, it's okay to, to listen to what is going to be dialogue, but because we want to honor that conversation. We want to honor that space. We want to give you a venue to start that conversation, not only here, but as we advance forward, you know, so we can continue to have that conversation. So that brings us to where we're at now. So I'm going to turn it back over to Ted because he's got some great panelists that he's going to introduce us to. Thank you, Omar. Tonight we're going to spend the majority of our time um, up here with a panelist 
uh, a, a panel rather of, of folks who are going to be bringing uh, some questions and hopefully some answers and some understanding and sharing some experiences that I know will enrich and equip all of us in a more positive way. So I'm going to go ahead and ask each of them to come on up. I'm going to be here on the end uh, kind of moderating the questions. Uh, we also have uh, come on up Jonathan, uh, Dr. Jonathan Smith from Redeemer uh, Anglican Church right here in Castleberry. Uh, we also have tonight uh, Chief Larry Krantz, who is the Chief of Police for our own Castleberry uh, Police Officers. And then we also are going to have Pastor Andre Martin, who is going to come and join us also on the panel from Divine Truth Christian Center. So, And guys, there are some waters right behind me here if you'd like one. Have you ever seen a, a more good-looking group up here in your life? I mean, it's just, wow. It's just, it's staggering, isn't it, Jonathan? It's, Absolutely. It's staggering. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Glad to represent. That's right. So, uh, Jonathan, I'm going to start with you, my friend. Um, and the question is, what do we do with our history of racism? Yes. Um, I remember when I received the document and I was uh, given this question. I thought to myself, how appropriate uh, for me to talk about that, because that's a question that I think um, I've had to wrestle with most of my life. So I want to give you a little bit of background and talk to you uh, in terms of personal story. And what I want to do tonight is to tell you my story, and I'm going to use the word I, because I think it's important that you hear from me and not necessarily representing everyone. Particularly, I don't represent all white people. Now, that would be wrong for me to stand up here or sit up here. I'm sitting tonight. I usually stand. I'm a preacher, so I stand. But uh, it would definitely be wrong uh, for me to do that. But I'm going to tell you my story. So my story is that I come from a southern family, uh, a family that has roots uh, all the way back in Georgia, uh, way past uh, the Confederacy. Um, my father, I know he's watching right now, and, and he's from uh, those parts of Georgia. And uh, my mother's side of the family is also mostly from Georgia, although I had a grandfather that's from Syracuse, so that's my one out right there. That's where I get my red hair apparently from. But growing up as a, uh, a white boy and then it was a white man, I came to of age in the 90s. The one thing that I had to reconcile is being a representative of a people group that own slaves. Perhaps not knowing exactly how they were treated in my own family, but knowing that history was there. Knowing that my family, not immediate family, not even several generations ago, but in the history, fought in the Civil War on the South. In fact, there was a brief time in my own life where I was a Civil War reenactor and was always on the South until I began to reconcile with the history. So the question becomes, how do I handle that? How do I process that? And I think that the question gets down to the raw truth that racism, if we define it correctly, which Omar, I think, did a great job, if we define it as one race viewing itself as superior to another race, that there is definitely a history that I have to reconcile with. And it was sinful. And I need to say that it was sinful as a pastor because the Bible makes, clear, makes it clear, right, that at the foot of the cross, we are all equal. At the foot of the cross, when Jesus dies on the cross, and I'm going to preach the gospel because that's the way I, I work, okay, so that's where we got to go, right? But the gospel teaches us that we are all equal, particularly in our sin right? But not all sins are the same. And we don't even need to give value to them. It's just that they're different. And there was a history, particularly of European history, of one race suppressing another race. Now, we talked about that in terms of uh, the last time we talked about uh, slavery, and we talked about the unique type of slavery that occurred here in the States. When you treat another person as a piece of property, degradating them, destroying their family unit, 
uh, destroying the bonds of marriage, that's sin. And I would say that that defines racism. So I think that there is an aspect where we can say, yes, there was racism in our country. Now the question is, is what do we do with it? That's the question. What do we do with that particular historical fact? And if we try to whitewash over that, or we try to minimize it, particularly as me as a, as a white man, if I do that, all I am doing is committing another sin. If I don't call it a sin, then I've committed a sin, because sin is sin, right? And how we apply that then becomes to the grace of God, right? Because if Christ died for the sinner, he died for the racist. And so how do we begin to move forward? And that was, of course, next week. But I think the very first question that we have to acknowledge and recognize is that, yes, it did exist. Now, when we start talking about national figures, uh, when we start talking about historical figures, there were some theologians that were conservative, evangelical, that argued for slavery, particularly in the South. And we have to look at that and we have to reconcile that. And how do we reconcile is to say, were they misguided? Well, absolutely. Absolutely. Because it was, as Omar again was pointing out, it can be something that is taught to other generations. Racism is taught. Racism is modeled. When my children were coming of age, particularly when my two boys, my, my uh, uh, youngest boy, uh, he was born in 2014. And I remember changing his diaper. And I remember uh, looking at him and looking at his, his white, you know what. And I said, my son is being born into a world that is going to judge him by the color of his skin. That is a thought that went through my mind. Does that sound familiar? And I think that that's why we have to have this conversation. Because I think my brother Andre has said the same thing. And I think that that's where the rhetoric has gotten to to this point, particularly uh, as, as a white man, where I say, am I frustrated? Yes, very frustrated. How do we begin to have this particular dialogue in a constructive manner? So I'm going to stop right there and you guys want to add anything? Or I can keep going. I can go for a while, but. I'm going to ask a different question, and it's this one. And this is to you, Andre, and I'm sorry it's a really loaded one. <laughs> but it's this question of whose lives matter? Do black lives matter or do all lives matter? Both and. <laughs> you saw what I did there, both and. Because in the Western mindset, um, we see, typically see things, no pun intended, as black and white. Either it's all lives matter or none at all. But in the Eastern mindset, which is actually the biblical mindset, it's actually both and. Um, meaning that it's kind of like a quick example. If you all have been on social media, there was a, a five-year-old boy that was killed by um, a black male. And many of them, there's a lot of um, different types of memes. Memes are M-E-M-E -M -E is a photo that basically um, touts an irony or uh, a possible his hypocrisy and puts it in pictorial form and so that's what's on social media right and so they put his face there and they said uh, say his name okay so that's what's on social media right now as far as one particular perspective and so the reaction to that is okay well if I were to say all lives matter as a response to that is that correct or does it, is it just that his life really matters because he shouldn't have died that way? So if I say all lives matter in the instance of that young man and basically saying that, well, his life is no different than anybody else's, that would be very insensitive to his family, as a quick example. So the truth of the matter is, is that from a biblical perspective, all life does matter, but not everybody is a Christian or has a biblical mindset. And so... I believe that your life matters, but just not as much. I believe it's important, but not as much as mine. You know, if, it, if I had to choose between my family 
and what I believe versus your family, then I'm going to choose mine over yours. So that's kind of where that terminology comes from. And sometimes what the reason why that is seen by some circles as an insult is because what it's saying is, is that we're not saying that um, a person who is, who, is, who is white or Caucasian life is less than. We're just saying that the system of racism, if racism is more of like a system, we have to dissect those words. Racism, bigotry, prejudice, we have to, those are all different things. And so when we talk about all lives matter, I do believe all lives actually matter. But sometimes when somebody says that, that does not have the right heart, they're really meaning to belittle the fact that, um, or they, they say it as a, as a response to complaining by black people because we've already given you enough already. But it shouldn't be seen that way. It actually should be seen as, okay, yes, all lives do matter, but the way that we're treated, it seems like the words that you say does not match up with your actions. That's really the, the case in point. And so the young, young so that when I believe, so here's the proper response. The proper response is when you see somebody put a meme like that, the biblical or the godly response to that is that was a tragedy. It never should have happened. The little boy should have uh, should receive justice, and he and he did get justice at least as far as our legal system is concerned. Because the same day a 24-hour manhunt was put out, the person was apprehended, no bail, sitting in jail waiting for sentencing. Whereas Breonna Taylor no knock warrant was killed inside of her home they were not criminals it was just the wrong house but those people are still free and so when we see those two together what a lot of black people are saying is that hey if there's a situation that happens like that it shouldn't take weeks for us to gather all of the details to make sure if it's legitimized or not and it shouldn't take several videos it was just it wasn't a video of the little boy getting killed it was just couple of eyewitness testimony, manhunt, arrested, that was it. So what we're looking for in regards to All Lives Matter is that I, I really, I don't speak for all black people, but at least from a, from a, at least from a general standpoint, what we're saying is, is that we want to receive the same treatment. Now we'll get the same treatment if it's a black person versus a black person. But if it's a situation to where you see a certain segment of society as being untouchable, and I'm not talking about the good police officers, but I'm talking about there's some police officers that are not good and that do have implicit as well as explicit bias, and they carry those things out in the way that they arrest people, when that gets brought to the surface, we can't just say, well, all lives matter, or what about Chicago? I live in Oviedo, Florida. Okay. I live in Oviedo, Florida, so just like politics are local, so are certain types of issues that cities deal with. They're also local. And so Chicago doesn't represent all black people, but just like um, that, um, the situation between George Floyd and those police officers, that doesn't re represent all officers. And so I think that as Americans, definitely, that we really need to understand that things are really both and and not either or. It's either you are racist or not. It doesn't have to be. It, race probably didn't have anything to do with it. It was a crossfire. Maybe drugs were involved. I don't know. It was a crossfire, and it just happened to be a black man and a white young boy. Nothing more than that, right? But what happens if it wasn't? Maybe what happens if it was on purpose? Maybe what happens if it was racially motivated? How would you know that? So you have to have data in order to back up certain things. And so I believe that all lives do matter as long as you believe that, too. As long as you believe that, too. I had some to that. I think that one of the mistakes with the phrase uh, "Black Lives Matter" uh, that particularly uh, gets people into trouble mm -hmm. is they Google "Black Lives Matter" and then they go to the website. And everybody knows what I'm talking about, right? They go to the website, and uh, for those of us nerdy white guys, okay, which I represent, maybe a geeky white guy, <laughs> but then I go read the fine print. Now, what do they believe? Oh! <gasps> And then, oh, well, I'm just not going to support that. What that actually is, is an example of transductional logic. So let me explain transductional logic. Transductional logic works this way. We, it, it's actually a childhood development. And it happens around eight, seven, etc. And it works like this. If this is that way, then that is that way. 
oh, so now Black Lives Matter means the statement that's on the 501c3, right? And so then let me tell you what happens. Then the police, the policing, uh, particularly in conservative white communities starts. And then in conservative white communities, what happens is don't use that phrase because do you know what it actually represents? That's transductional logic. It's not using the phrase in the context that it is actually being understood. So I want to point that out because I think it's a mistake because what happens is uh, if, and I actually, this experience, I experienced this. So um, I, I remember back in June, I was posting a lot in June. And then all of a sudden I got those wonderful messages from Facebook, you know, the little Facebook messenger when people send you private things. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's always done in Christian terms, right? You know, because I care about you. (laughs) Really, I haven't heard from you in two years. That happened to me. And it was 10 reasons why I don't support Black Lives Matter. And I was like, and I went, and so I read the article. I was like, this has nothing to do with the issue. This is not about a political movement. This is about what Pastor Andre just said that they matter too, right? That, that black people matter too, that white people matter too. And if we, if we approach things from sort of that nerdy point of view that I'm talking about, that goes and looks and suddenly writes blog, blog articles instead of dialoguing, well, that's when we start getting into a circle that doesn't win and doesn't take us anywhere. So that, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I think it's a good distinction that we can move on to the next question. I think it's a good distinction that people know the difference between the 501c3 organization, Black Lives Matter, and the value of black and brown people. Does everybody understand the difference between the two? Okay, that's very important because a lot of people don't see the difference between the two. But the good news is is that typically when you pull out that distinction, they're like, oh, okay, I see where you're talking about. You're not uh, critical race theory and, and, and to Marxism and and a lot of those things, and even W.E.B. Du Bois spoke about how Marxism is not really beneficial to the African-American community. And without getting into the weeds of that, um, it's just important that you know that distinction. Maybe the wording is the wording, but I believe that if you believe, as the Constitution says, that all men are created equal and we're endowed by a creator to have inalienable rights, then just mean that. Be sincere about it. And and then it doesn't go any further than that for me. And so we can work up through the, some of the other little, smaller details, but just notice that there's a difference between the organization and then the value and the dignity of the Imago Dei or the image and likeness of God, which happens to also be black and brown people. That's the difference. To go back a generation, it's like the difference between the Civil Rights Movement and the Black Panther Party. So it, history repeats itself, right? Right, so you look at the charter of the Black Panther Party as opposed to what Martin Luther King and some of the others do. Now, there's people in my circle who really would be upset at me making that distinction because there's some people believe that the Black Panther Party and a lot of things that they did were beneficial to the community, and a lot of it they did was beneficial to the community, but not all of it was. And so just like a generation ago, you knew that there was a distinction between the Civil Rights Movement and then the Black Panther Party, so it is today with... Um, people who have black life who just want to be treated equal when they get arrested as opposed to Black Lives Matter, the 501c3 organization, which really denigrates a lot of what I stand for, which is the cohesiveness of the black family. That's also in the fine print, right? Right. And so that's the distinction. Thank you, gentlemen. Chief Krantz, it's great to have you with us tonight. I'm looking at this question here about um, the police department itself and uh, law enforcement. Uh, what do you see happening there uh, among law enforcement and among just to get local, our, our own Castleberry Police Department, uh, to strengthen connections in our community? Well, good evening, everybody. And thank you for taking the time out of your evening to come join us for this very important conversation. Uh, as was stated, this is our second conversation, and there's one more, at least one more planned. Um, before I get into that, though, I just wanted to touch on a couple quick things. Um, you know, from a police perspective, there is so much that happens in our community that we get involved in and that we want to be a positive influence on. 
and to touch on what was happening here in this conversation relative to Black Lives Matter, all lives matter. It's interesting from a law enforcement perspective. One of the things that I have grown up in my career and what I preach to my folks are every life matters. It doesn't matter their race, their gender, their ethnicity, their sexual orientation. That when we're in a community and we're protecting the community and we're engaging them, that you treat everybody with dignity and respect. It matters not the color of their skin or what their religious beliefs are or anything like that. So those are one of the things that we attempt to do and um, bring that message home in everything that we do and try to have a positive impact in everyone that we meet. Um, doesn't mean that we don't have a job to do in law enforcement, making arrests, solving crime, things like that. It's a small, when you look at what we do in law enforcement each and every day, making arrests is a very small percentage of that. There is so much more that we do in our communities every day. So to launch off on what you're talking about in the, relative to the question, what's important to me in our agency here in Castleberry is to have a relationship with the community, but not just a relationship, a relationship that's built on trust, right? If you imagine, if you will, this building, it has a foundation and it has walls, the roof, structure, there's so much that goes into this, but without the foundation, you don't have the rest of it. So what we're trying to do is continue to strengthen those bonds, those relationships, by having a strong foundation that we can continue to build upon. So there are a number of things that we do each and every day. Um, one of the things is I, when I came on board here, I wanted to make sure that we were engaging in our community in a number of different ways. One of the things I thought was really critical for us was the chaplaincy program. So we instituted a volunteer chaplaincy program within the Casper Police Department, which I'm proud to say that Andre is a member, Ted, Andy. So thank you guys for being a part of that. There's so much positive that comes out of that relationship, not only for me, but for the officers and our community. The more that we take opportunity to educate the community about what it is that we do and how we do it and why we do things, the better off we are, the better off the community is. Because typically when we don't know something, we're afraid of it, right? We're, kinda, we're just a little hesitant about it. But when we know more about it, we tend to get more involved. We want to know more or how can I impact our community in a different way positive way. So we um, also do community outreach through a number of avenues throughout the, uh, throughout the year. But we also look for opportunities to uh, engage our youth. Now engaging our youth is very important. I feel it's important that the youth understand that yes we are police officers but we are human beings and we have families, we have lives and that they can trust us. So we have a, a youth police academy through the South Seminole Middle School as well that we reach out and, and touch and engage the youth through the school system. Through our, uh, and we also have the school resource officer that does it as well. Um, we also have a fishing derby. Uh, each year we will engage with the youth, some of the uh, at risk, if you will, and get them rewarded through the uh, school. We will partner with the school system to identify those children that we may have a positive impact on. And then we bring them over to Secret Lake Park and we spend the day with them. We teach them how to fish and we teach them some other life lessons as well. And then make a little competition and then we, uh, when we break it off, we give them some parting words of wisdom and some gifts for prizes. And then we, uh, they allow to keep the fishing gear as well, which is always a great treat, but we also got to make sure we clip the hooks off of the fishing poles before they get on the bus. <laughs> Don't want anybody getting hurt. Uh, so there are just a number of ways that we each day look in our community. But if I make just one more point, having come from a very large organization and being blessed with this opportunity here in Castleberry, 
I have the unique ability to converse with each applicant that comes through and wants to be a member of our team. My staff does a tremendous job at doing the backgrounds and doing the other uh, pre-hire interviews and whatnot to uh, bring the best candidate forward to me. And then I will engage them in a conversation. I don't call it an interview, and I'm very clear and upfront with them that it's a conversation between the two of us because I want to get to know them. I want to know what's in their heart. Why do they want to serve in our community? Why do they want to serve in law enforcement? How can they better us? What can they bring to our agency that's going to improve what it is that we do in our community? So I'm looking for those traits, those character traits, and everyone that I hire that is going to seek the opportunities to make us better. Thank you, Chief. Chief, I have a confession to make. The fishing derby, I had some trouble at the fishing derby. <laughs> I didn't catch anything, and that's all I wanted to say. So well, I'll, I'll mention it to our scuba diver for next year. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll make sure we'll hook you up with a big one. This is an interesting question that, um, um, Andre, may, maybe you can help me to understand this better because I, I was looking at this, and I think I've got definitions working for these two, but, and, and maybe each, each of you may help me here, but what is the difference between racism and prejudice? When I think about racism, I think about how we've been talking about, you know, the, the feeling of superiority of one person over another. And when I think about prejudice, I think of that as being preconceived notions about another person. But I may not be completely complete in my understanding. Well, I think the latter is accurate as far as prejudice. Um, sometimes people synonymize the words and they're really not the same. Um, so without getting into um, sociology and all of those different types of things, prejudice means that when you look at somebody, you prejudge them based on what you have heard. Like, I, was, I wasn't being facetious when I said that sometimes people get their idea of what black people are like or maybe even what white people are like from movies, such as if you see a white gentleman come into a movie theater with um, bright blue hair and glasses, then he's a serial killer. That's a prejudice. Maybe he's just coming in there because he broke up with his girlfriend. He's just trying to watch a movie in order to deal with what has happened. But that's a real thing. And so people scoot away from him or everybody's looking at him. Oh, you better wait, make sure he doesn't have a Columbine. He look like he's from Columbine. That's a prejudice. Or you listen to rap songs and you see mug shots and then automatically think to yourself, well, based on what they do in Chicago, <laughs> then that means that there's a lot of black people who are looking for handouts or in households where there are no uh, fathers present. They may not be married, but there's fathers that are present, but that, that's a preconceived notion. Or they are all Democrats. And so when they talk, they talk from a uh, political standpoint that is contrary to what I believe without even having a conversation with them. And so that's why I appreciate the chief because what the chief is doing is allowing for there to be people who may not necessarily be within the same circle, well, that are typically in their own bubble, ideologically speaking, racially speaking, to actually cross-pollinate. That's how you eliminate a lot of prejudice attitudes is when you actually talk to somebody one-on-one. -on -one. Let's have a conversation. Oh, we actually have a lot of ideas that are similar to each other. Um, except if, unless you're a Cowboys fan. If you're a Cowboys fan, I'm a New York Giants fan, I do have a prejudice against you. <laughs> and it is absolutely biased. <laughs> but I'm just teasing. So, so the main idea with prejudice is, is typically you prejudge somebody when you really haven't gotten to know that person. And so that's why chaplaincy and community policing is such an effective thing. Because when you actually get to really know somebody, then you may still have some implicit bias, but you can work through that. And so I believe that friendship and camaraderie is one of the best ways to get through some of those issues. Now, racism, on the other hand, racism is like the institutional, like institutionalized, where it's a power structure that is put in place to where the elite of the country um, has set up things, banking systems and the whole nine yards that benefits one group of people over the other. And it's permeated through the justice system 
and the whole nine yards to where when you see one particular group of people as being in power, they put things in place until it actually becomes the norm. And so when it becomes a norm, you don't see anything wrong with it because if you're a part of the engine, if you're a screw as a part of the engine, you don't know that you're part of the engine unless somebody tells you. So when it comes to institutionalized racism, when somebody says, I'm not racist, typically they're, they're not the same thing as, a, as, they're not synonymous with the system. They're just part of the system. You get what I'm saying? So it's like a political infrastructure. There's the individual and then there's um, conservative principles. There's the individual and then there's liberal principles. So they're not one and the same. It's just that the person is a, can be a part of that machine if they choose to or not. And so prejudice is typically what everybody has. Everybody in this building has their own prejudice. Okay. And love and respect and friendship can help move through those things. But as far as racism is concerned, it's, it's, it's a power structure. But I will say that um, in my own experience, that power structure is really not always apparent at certain low income levels and even middle class. It really starts changing once you get at the very high income level, which is, okay, we're going to be a football team, uh, African-American and a team of other um, players are going to buy a NFL football team, which is going to be billions and billions of dollars. What, and this is just an example of that. So what will end up happening is, is that because people are so used to being in power, there will be different types of laws or little political things that will be done in order to hinder that person from actually buying the team outright. So there would have to be more effort, more vetting done than the average person will have to do. Some things will be handled by a handshake between the existing power structure, but then if it's African American that buys a NFL team, unless they are somebody that's so popular and, and it's overwhelming, there, there's going to be additional hoops that they would have to jump through because now you're part of this elite class that most of us are really not a part of. And so it's a little bit harder to discern, but I could definitely say that most people have their own prejudices, but racist and the racist um, infrastructure is something that people don't really quite grasp because it's, it's, it's not something that you can see. It's kind of like the church, the building, and then the church being the people. It's, it's, it's kind of hard to explain, but that's what it is by definition. Thank you. Uh, something he touched on was important, struck me as being very important to talking about relationships and trust. Right? They have to be trust. Well, how do you build those relationships? Just by talking with people and understanding, but listening. You have to listen to the person across the aisle. We have never, maybe never, experienced the same things as your neighbor has experienced. We didn't grow up in the same community or the same environment, the same backgrounds. So when I mentioned earlier about sometimes being afraid of the unknown, don't be. Educate, talk, listen. The more you listen, the better you can understand, and the better you can maybe change your behavior or your perspective. I think we all, as adults here, have experienced something where we were probably very firm in our belief on something, right? And then new fact information developed whether via a friend or a relative or an acquaintance or just maybe reading and becoming knowledgeable on a particular subject and it changed your perspective and you evolved. That's what we all must do at some level. We have to evolve. We have to understand that we all are different, but that's not a negative. The differences that we have in our community, in our state, in our country, or positive attributes that should be exploited for everything positive and not for the negative. There is so much strength and compassion and love in this community and in this country that there is absolutely nothing from my perspective that we cannot meet head on and conquer by coming together as a group, regardless of your age, your sex, your race, your ethnicity, and sit down around the table and talk to one another and understand how we best can move forward together to make an improvement, whatever that situation might be. So real quickly, I'll touch on the violence that happens in a variety of communities. We're blessed that we have a great relationship in our community and we don't have the things happening here locally. But from a police perspective, we will support 
and protect and defend everyone's right to peacefully protest and address their concerns. What is concerning to me as a police executive is that when that behavior turns to disruptive criminal behavior, there's a cost to that behavior in our communities. And it shouldn't be just the police standing up and saying, that's wrong, that's inappropriate. It should be the community going, whoa, whoa, hold on. We agree with your perspective or your challenge or your issue or your concern, and we want to help you, but do it the right way, not this way. There's always a positive way and a negative way. And if you do it the negative way, it detracts from your purpose. It causes or allows others to bring forth their perspective that might be against your progress to move forward. Don't feed them. Don't give them that energy. Let's all stay together on the one side and the positive side and work together, which is why we're doing what we're doing. And I'm proud to be a part of it, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this. Because it's my firm belief that many movements, if you will, start at the grassroots level and gain momentum. If we had the, you know, I don't mean this in a negative way, but if we had, you know, uh, 450,000 people out here marching, well, that might be short-lived because they come, they, leave, they, you know, they say, and they move on. This is an opportunity for us to continue to grow this, take it momentum forward, and maybe, just maybe, we can be what is right in our community as an example of how we can come together and work with one another and listen to one another. And that's the big thing that I tell my officers as well. Listen. Don't just direct but listen to them. You'll be surprised what you might learn when you shut this and open this. Okay, that's enough. Thank you, Chief. Oh, and I wanted to touch on one thing just really quickly. Some of you all may have heard the term, um, especially when it comes to the word or the, the use of the word racist. You may have heard an African-American person say, a black person can't be racist. Okay. The reason why they say a black person can't be racist is because we, just by sheer proportion, are not the majority of people in the, in the, in the community. So we do not have the people in place to, that can turn knobs, if you will, to make another group or another community do one thing or another. A good example of this is in Africa, or which is actually the continent, but there's many different countries in Africa where there are a majority of African people. Um, and so, an equivalent of that would be like a white person that would be going through a situation that their relatives and they are just trying to work hard. They came over to that specific country within Africa and they start working. But then the political structure says or has determined behind closed doors that we're not really going to let them be in charge of anything. We'll let them have their little, you know, their little parks and, you know, their little houses. But anything bigger than that, we're not going to let them do that. So that's kind of that particular angle. And so black people in the American sense can't be racist because we don't have the power structure behind us in order to be able to say whether or not you get a job based on how your name sounds. That's just the truth. But a black person can be prejudiced. You see the distinction which is well, you better not bring that girl home if you can't comb her hair. <laughs> if, you, if that comb stops, <laughs> if, that comb, if that comb doesn't stop, then don't bring her home. And some of you all may have said the same. Well, if, that, if you can't comb her hair all the way through, then don't bring her home. Right? Right. Because we said these certain things because we want to preserve a certain type of culture at home. But that's where the, the prejudice gets into play. And that happens um, all over the place. And so as a pastor, what I try to do, and as Jonathan does, is that when we see those behaviors, say, okay, what does the Bible say? Because another underlying thing that we all as pastors are struggling with right now is trying to deal with people who do not believe in absolute truth. Postmodern relativism, this is where you get all these perspectives come from, but what does the Bible say? <laughs> do you believe in objective truth? There is a right and there is a wrong. Not, everybody has different perspectives, but what is the truth? What is the bottom line truth? And that is something as a nation that we struggle with. What, would you say your truth versus my truth? No, that's not how it really is. It's what is God's truth. What does God say about it? That should settle a lot of things, but not everybody 
is, uh, believes that God's word is authoritative. And so that's a whole other theological matter to take us about 500 years or so to deal with. <laughs> oh, gosh, I'll be there. Another question um, I kind of like to address here is, is this whole thing about cancel culture. Um, I'm old enough to remember when the term politically correct was a term and how when people would say, oh, that's not politically correct, you would have a room of people that would laugh and they would think that's silly. You know, why do we care, you know, uh, what this decision or that decision uh, we, we, we had, this is the way we think and we don't care what is politically correct. You find that those kind of, of laughing uh, episodes don't happen anymore because it has become such a, to a place of such importance and such holding such power in so many circles that it has morphed into what we can look at and see as cancel culture. And you guys have seen this. Everybody has seen it. Uh, we see it in the sports world. You know, if, 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 if one athlete kneels and another athlete stands during the national anthem, I mean, we have seen them be treated in different ways depending on what the culture is, right, or what the community standards were. We see it in, I've even seen it in the church. You know, if a pastor relates one particular view and the community has a very different view, they may be fired, let go, disciplined, whatever. We see it in media. We see it in, uh, you know, all, all these different arenas. Um, do you guys think that this cancel culture, which in my view has sprung out of the political correctness culture, um, what, what do you guys see with this movement? Is it helping? Is it hurting? Is there a happy medium there somewhere? What do you think? Well, thank you. Um, I want to read a quote that was actually from the Sydney Morning Herald. So this is all the way in New South Wales, Australia. And um, it's interesting because they're dealing with the same issues and the same questions in different ways, but uh, certainly it's perplexing. Um, Australian musician Nick Cave says, cancel culture has an asphyxiating effect on the creative soul of a society. And political correctness has grown to become the unhappiest, unhappiest religion in the world. Tolerance allows the spirit of inquiry, the confidence to roam freely, to make mistakes, to self-correct, to be bold, to dare to doubt, and in the process to chance upon new and more advanced ideas. Without mercy, society grows inflexible, fearful, vindictive, and humorless. It's a powerful quote, and I, and I thought that he really uh, nailed it. And, and so for some of you, we probably should define what cancel culture is, and uh, in order to do that, I read a bunch of articles, and I'm still not entirely clear. So, which means that cancel culture is used in different ways. But if, essentially, it is the effect of silencing of someone when they said something that they shouldn't have said. A good example of this actually happened to a pastor that uh, I dearly love. His name is Louis Giglio. And Louis Giglio sprung up on the news uh, recently because he was preaching a a sermon against racism, but he made a mistake, and this is the mistake that he made. He said white blessing instead of white privilege. That was term was taken, and immediately a social media firestorm broke out against him. Now, I've been following the man for a long time, and I tell you what, when God made a preacher, he fits the perfect mold. He's an amazing, amazing preacher, amazing communicator of the gospel. But he then later, almost immediately, I think it was the next day or, or a day later, he, um, he, he did an apology through a YouTube video. And you could see the trepidation in his voice. You could hear it. I mean, he was, he was moved. Now, here is the question that, that I raise in my own mind. Did it really help him? My answer is no. Because what cancel culture does is that it just immediately begins to draw parties from one direction to another. It goes this way to that. It goes right to left, right? Just depending on what your, your philosophies are. 
And so what we do is we immediately, the word is polarized. And so we continue getting into this polarized uh, dialogue that goes nowhere. I remember, you know, political correctness used to mean just to be respectful in the things that you say, right? And then it grew rapidly out of that. I mean, we, I mean there was a show called Politically Incorrect. Mm -hmm. Remember Politically Incorrect, right? And that's when you said things you shouldn't say. You know, growing up, I was taught to be polite, but not anymore. Now there is no dialogue, and that's the problem, that we talk past each other rather than talking with each other. I, I appreciated, Chief Krantz, when you, you talked about uh, listening, that we have stopped listening, and we run to prejudgments as to what the other party's saying. And that's when we get frustrated, and the conversation doesn't move forward. So that's, you know, I, I, I had to, like I said, I had to look up what cancel culture means. And there are good examples of it when a person, it, officially it means when a person loses their job. They said perhaps one thing, and then that person is immediately dismissed. Omar and I were talking about it before uh, the talk, and where is the, where is the idea of forgiveness and mercy and atonement, Right? Where does the person say, you know, I shouldn't have said that? That revealed an area of my own heart, and I'm real sorry that I said that. And if I did offend you, I'm sorry. That wasn't my goal. See, there's, a, there's, a, there's an aspect of where the word, in, in, as Christians, is grace. There is no grace. Now, I want to say this right up front, and I think Pastor Andre nailed it. Not everybody's a Christian. No. <laughs> and we're dealing with an un- Christian culture that is far from what Christians uh, or Christianity has taught, far from the truth of the Bible. And so as Christians, the question really becomes, are we engaging in cancel culture? And I think we are on both sides. We, whoops, there goes that thing. Um, you know, we, we say that we're open-minded, but are we? Are we engaging in the same kind of behavior? Because that's the key. Are we getting online and trying to silence the other person through very long Facebook threads. The one thing that I like to do sometimes is I'll say something on Facebook to see what happens, and then I'll sit back and watch it. Yeah. Anybody you sure do not that? gaslighting, sir. Yeah, yeah, I'll gaslight, you know, especially if I'm bored, right? I'll just put something out there. Okay, watch this. Okay, this is what Jesus said, and I'll, and I'll wait. Wow, that took half an hour to get some comments on that, but that's what Jesus said. You make some political statements, or if you say something in a different direction that a person doesn't agree with, it, it can happen. And we use Louis Giglio as, as an example, but it, it happens all the time because, and this is what is most concerning to me, is that we've stopped listening. We've stopped dialoguing. We're ju we are jumping to uh, our prejudices and our and our. Our, our own conclusions. And, and that's dangerous, dangerous territory. When we stop talking, bad things happen. Going back to my own Southern heritage, the reason why we fought a civil war is because we stopped talking. That concerns me today. Not that I don't want to be a prophet of doom, but it concerns me that when we stop talking, and we start, you know, drawing uh, sides that we get into very dangerous areas. And then things start getting uh, very confused. And I want to say that social media has not helped. No. Now, I'm not one that gets up there and says social media is of the devil. But let me tell you something. There's plenty of sin in social media. And I think that that's one of the things that we as Christians have to look at very carefully. Okay, so go ahead. Oh, real quick, um, I just have to touch on this because social media aspect is where I was going to go down. I think there's unfortunately a tremendous lack of respect for a lot of people that have opposing views. Why? Why can you not respect someone who thinks differently than you? Are they less human? That's one of the biggest things that concerns me. I know my beautiful wife and I, she's here in the back. 
we have these conversations and we have young children that we're trying to raise and think and respect people's opinions. And there are times where you just have to respectfully say, yeah, we agree to disagree and move on. It's okay. But when I look on the TV and I hear things that people are saying and how they attack them because of that differing view and sometimes not even just in a, I don't know, just a very degrading, demeaning fashion and how they speak about or at someone else and at times even yelling just because the person has a different perspective. I don't know when it started. Some people argue it started with the, uh, the trophy for everything. <laughs> but, <laughs> I showed up, give me a trophy. I don't know, but how do we get back to that? In the broad perspective of respect, respect in the community, respect to your neighbors, respect to your friends, respect to your elders, your uh, parents, your authority figures, and conversely, back and forth. We really have to start getting back to that respectful tone. And it's okay. This is not a football game where one side has to win. We must look at what's the greater good for our community as a whole. When we do that, we all win. But until, in my opinion, social media has played such a significant role and people are so brave behind the keyboard. And it gets out there in the world and it causes others to get their aisle ranked up or they, others like-minded will support them. And just, it's very interesting to watch and it's sad at the same time from my perspective. Uh, maybe others don't have the same viewpoint, but when I sit back and see that, it just boils down very simply to me is that there's just a lack of respect for others that have differing viewpoints, and that troubles me because we all are different, and it's about time we start using our differences as strengths and not as some divisiveness in our communities. Okay, I... I'll go ahead and air out my frustration about the cancel culture. Maybe it was the way that I was raised because my dad was a tough man and he raised us to have tough skin. And so it bothers me when I have to kind of dance around words and try to be political. I, I can't do it. You know, I'll be quick to call somebody a snowflake and I won't make any apologies about it. And if you don't like it, then I'm securing myself because I believe that you know, this is just the way that I was raised, uh, um, uh, Chief, that I, I had tough coaches in football, the way that they would converse with me, you know, even the way the NFL players, how they talk, you know, there's Tony Dungy style. You know, I would be responsible to a Mike Ditka type style, you know, you know, brass knuckles type of thing. And so that's just how I was raised. But I have to understand that not everybody is deals with things that way. You know, my son, for example, my son, my oldest son, he's more of a conversationalist. My youngest boy, if I try to be conversational with him, he'll just kind of look at you. So I have to be a little bit more tougher with him. I have to use Mike Dick approach with him, and I have to use Tony Dungy with the other one. And so, so I, I, I don't like putting people in a position where they can't speak their mind. I can't stand it because that means that you're not being truthful about it. Hey, if you like Rush Limbaugh and you like Sean Hannity, then, hey, let's talk about it. Let's, let's see what this arena of ideas, some of y'all know where that buzzword comes from, right? Let's go ahead and talk about these things in the arena of ideas. Let's get some perspective going back and forth. And I guess the reason why I like to hear what other people think from in conclusion is, goes back to this show called Crossfire. Anybody remember Crossfire? From like a long time ago? That's like, okay, for all my millennials and Gen Z, this is, this is an old show where you had, this is what I thought was the very beginnings of, even um, after, after, um, 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 what is that? William F. Buckley talking with the other gentleman. It escapes my brain right now. But um, Crossfire, where you had two different views, maybe Republican, Democrat, somebody, and they would just go at it. But then the two gentlemen would stand up and shake hands and then smoke their cigars and then just go on out the door as best friends. And so that's what I hope that we return to, where you can have a different perspective, but you can still shake hands as men, or you can still hug as, as ladies, or shake hands as ladies, with two different opposing views, and then 
going about your business. And so, you know, I struggle with that. I don't know if I'm a throwback, maybe I'm closed minded, but I really like for people to tell the truth. I don't think that you have to be abrasive in telling the truth. You can have honey and castor oil together. One of them cleans all the crap out and the other one is easy to take down, but it's still, somebody got that. <laughs> you were raised right. right? <laughs> but I want people to tell okay. the truth. Just tell the truth. <laughs> yeah. Can we, can we quote you on that, Andre? Uh, yes, you okay. can. So. The poor kids. Wow. <clears throat> the, uh, gosh, how do I transition to that, uh, from that? Um, you might want to just end it right there. Because I, wanna, I really want to get to the most important question for us as a church. Um, you guys, meaning you two here, and probably everybody here in this room, may have heard the statement, the local church is the hope of the world. You may have heard that said. And I still believe that, um, that, that every local church out there um, is a place of influence, inspiration, equippings. You know, it is the place where the gospel goes forth and the hope of the world is proclaimed to the world. Um, in the midst of all that we're going through, there is no pastor out there that is not struggling with the question, how can I get my church to be a part of the solution and not part of the ongoing problem? <laughs> right? You want to be positive. You want to think of ways. How can the hope that we preach, that we talk about, that we live into, how can it really affect this conversation? And it, it kind of makes us ask, well, what does the gospel say about this reality that we live in of racism and reconciliation and the systemic things that are going on? And how can we get the hope of what we have in Christ out there in the community? That's a big question to end on before we get to any of the uh, onlines that may have come. But in a, in a moment, what would you guys, as pastors, say to that question? I start with where I started off from the, the beginning, which is the cross of Christ. Which is to say that we're all equal at the foot of the cross. That we're all sinners. And that the only way to heaven is through the grace of God, right? So we start there. We, we have to start with the equality that the Bible actually elevates up. And then what we have to do is we have to take our sinful hearts and we have to compare it to what the Bible actually says. And we have to look at it and we have to use the, 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 uh, the litmus test of scripture that says where, am I, where is my heart in relation to the gospel? Jesus said, so I'm, we're preaching through Matthew at my church, and we've come to that really hard part where Jesus says, out of the heart flows all of this stuff, right? And, and, I mean, and it's not easy stuff. And when we realize that every one of us brings into the church our prejudices that are, that are sinful, our biases, uh, our attitudes that have not been conformed to Christ, that we impair the mission of the church. And so I think that one of the, 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 the hardest parts as a pastor is standing up and saying, this is sin. And being the first one to repent. This is sin. Looking around and saying, everybody, we, we have sinned. This is sin. And we have, to, we have to reconcile this. But you know, there's a freedom, I think, that comes from saying, I have sinned. And this is the freedom. The freedom is the declaration of forgiveness that God gives, the restoration hope that God provides to say that I don't have to be this way anymore. Paul said, you know, to the thief, become the giver. And so that there is a place where we can look at and say the church is the hope. Why is the church the hope? Because of what we're doing right now. I mean, what other forum right now exists in our society where we can gather together in a free association of people from different walks of life and have this conversation? I can't think of another forum that exists right now. It doesn't happen in schools because there's different types of rules and regulations. But when it comes to the church, we can have this conversation. So I think that not only do we start with the process of, of accepting where we have failed, but then also embracing the gospel and then recognizing the opportunity as an instrument of restoration and the hope of glory, right? 
if we can grasp that, then I think we have a chance. It's when we lose sight of that, that this, this brilliant thing that God created, the church. You know, when we lose sight of that and we lose sight of why he left us here. I mean, we'd all, let's just be honest. The one thing that I'm going to talk to God about when I get to heaven, say, Lord, I have a few things I want to go over with you. Uh, number one, how come when I got saved, I didn't just go directly to heaven? Well, that would have been a lot easier, wouldn't it? I think it's because he has a purpose to be salt and light. And so, wow, what an incredible opportunity we have to speak to new, you know, younger generations. You talked about Generation Z and millennials who are so... Uh, sensitive and and are are hearing things that are not necessarily true that we can speak to. Um, I remember uh, just one example in my own family. Um, White men are evil. White men are the problem. That was something that was coming up over and over and over again. White men are the problem. Well, wait a minute. I had to point this person, point out to this person, wait a minute, I'm white, am I part of the problem? Do you see that? And that's a real, real, let's use it, narrative that exists. We have to confront that, yes, white men are evil, and so are black men, and so are every other man that's ever had sin affect the heart, because that's what the Bible teaches. Well, we don't stay there. So it's an issue of discipleship. It's an issue of gospel. And most importantly, it is an issue of evangelism. We expect people to act like Christians, but they're not. And no, they're unregenerate people saying unregenerate things. Shouldn't be surprised at that. But we should share the gospel with them. Because it's only through the road of the gospel that we can never bring true reconciliation to this conversation. And I think that's so important um, without being redundant. I think that, as one wise man said a long time ago, you can't legislate morality. And so I would rather, I think the church has had a unique position to be able to deal with things that are really matters of the heart. Going all the way back to the Tower of Babel when pride was the reason why once unified people started to divide themselves. And we've seen the fruit of that even coming on today. But I'm also reminded in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, when it says that all of these people that were from different nations came on one accord. And because of the Holy Spirit, they all spoke the same language. And so when you have that unification and that mindset, we are like a, how, how should I say, a blessed unicorn by being an example um, to. And I'm, I'm very keenly aware, at least as far as my congregation, to not fit into those narratives because I, I don't know about other pastors, but most of the genuine pastors that I come across are fighting this battle of not being drugged into the political spectrum. It's, it's very, it's, it's not only difficult for the conservative side, it's difficult on the liberal side to not be pulled into these circles. So that's the reason why I try to stay as doggedly neutral and biblical as possible even to my own detriment. If uh, one particular president does it wrong in one particular administration, I'm going to say that. If it's a different party, I'm going to say that they're wrong regardless because my authoritative source is scripture. So I'm nobody's friend. I want politicians to tremble and be at joy when I come into the room because I want to tell the truth, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and, and, the, and then that's it. And so I think that being doggedly neutral, well, I won't say neutral, but being biblical and speaking truth to power when necessary is very important. This is how you get rid of people who are trying to pull you into the beast. And so that's that. And this is like church talk, you know, but in the back of my mind, I read the book of Revelation, which I thought was the scariest book in the Bible <laughs> for many years. And I remember this whole saying about the beast and the false prophet, the people who teach wrong, commingle with a governmental type system that is totally secular. And as the church, we can't be pulled into secular things. What did Jesus do? Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the widows, jailhouses, and the prisons. Gave of himself, was selfless. Talked to people who had issues. Talked to the Samaritan woman who said, we have no dealing with you Jews. 
that racial or prejudicial, the prejudicial type of issue that goes all the way back to Jeroboam or Rehoboam and the difference between the northern and southern kingdom, you know, all that church talk stuff. But, but Jesus was not into all of that. He wasn't into iconography, you know, what I look like. It was about, all about content and how you treated people and how you expressed love. And so as the church, I think we just need to do what Jesus did and, and not bend from that. And be able to recognize when somebody's trying to pull you into a political circuit. You don't, I don't mind talking with people about politics, but let me not, I, I want to endorse more so the character behind the person versus the policy. I think that's very important. And so if a politician comes up to me and says, you know, what do you think about my policies? I'm like, okay, well, this is what I think. Well, can you endorse me? No, I can't do that. I won't, I won't endorse you publicly. I'll endorse you as a good person. I'll, I'll pick up your kids if you need for me to. But as far as getting into politics, no, I can't be a part of that. I'm a part of it, but I'm not a part of it because my kingdom is not of this world. And, it's, and I, have to, I have to stick with that. <laughs> I have to yeah. stick with that. Even though, oh, you got all these people that you can influence. Yeah, but I'm trying to get people to heaven. <laughs> Amen. That's my that's my job, and so I think that staying orthodox so. is it's important to stay on task. Bigger issues, yeah, bigger issues. So there may be some questions we have from online, Andy. We do okay. So number one uh, is we can look back there, guys. Is what is the right response from police when they recognize they have a bad apple? A great question. Thank you for that. Well, first off, let me say that there is no one. How can I say this? The bad apple cop, worst enemy, is a good cop. The good cops, we don't want bad apples in our force. And when we identify someone who doesn't meet our standards, there is an investigative process that we undertake, depending on the scenario, and there could be discipline imposed up to and including termination. It, it all depends upon the facts of what the complaint is or the allegation is that's been made against the officer. But rest assured, in my department, there are certain things that are non-negotiables for me. Number one, excessive use of force. Number two, truthfulness. Number three, any discriminatory act. So if you are excessively using force, when you use a force that's inappropriate for the given situation, you don't need to work with us. If you discriminate, you don't need to work with us. And if you are a subject of anything and we ask you the question, you have to be truthful in your response. If you're not, you're not going to work for us. In a cop's life, our word is our bond. We have to testify. It very well could be a situation where, and it's just one-on-one, -on -one. it's the officer against the defendant, and it has to go before the court system. If the officer has jeopardized and compromised their integrity, they're no, they have no value moving forward in the court system. And if they can't do that, then they certainly don't hold a place in our agency. Thank you, Chief. Next question. What is the biggest roadblock to Christians talking about race right now, and why are we afraid to? Constituents. <laughs> when you are, and I come from a unique place. Um, I happen to be the pastor and founder of, of, of our church, um, built it from the ground up 10 years in. And sometimes if you are, have certain constituents that have a lot of power within your congregation that could hire you or fire you, then that could have a lot of influence on the way that you deal with things. And so for me, just specifically speaking to my specific situation, when you have that power dynamic sometimes in the pews, then you have, may be influenced just to keep your job to be one way or another or to quit. And so I think that when you have a congregation of loving people that are really about walking the walk and talking the talk, you should be able to bring anything to the table. But there are some churches that do not have the freedom to be able to do that. And I know that from personal experience. And it's not just about race only. It could be about things dealing with um, uh, doctrinal issues, the way that you see things. It's, it can be very political even in the pews. 
Yes, sir. Go. Go. I just have a question for Mark, but uh, no. Okay. Yeah. Well, let me just add one thing to that. I think that the other roadblock is uh, education. I think that Christians, we have to educate ourselves on what the issues are. A good example of this is um, learning about the history of segregation. Uh, and not the, the, the 500 year history, but just the last you know, 100 years or so of, of learning what happened to the black community. One of the big questions that I, I, I had to struggle with as a, as a young man is my father was a, a board member of the Orlando Rescue Mission. And um, what a wonderful ministry that is. And um, I grew up as a little, little kid um, going to the rescue mission. Now, the primary constituents of that time were black families. I would look around and I would say, well, there's not any white families here. What's going on here? Now, that wasn't a question that I asked overtly. It was just, a, it, it was just an experience that I had. So as I, I get older and I look around, I say, well, well why is it that the black community has struggled so much economically. Taking time to learn about the different types of, of laws, the racial structures that were in place, the racist structures that were in place that actually kept the black community from prospering economically. If, that, if we don't know that, then we say things that we, we out of ignorance that we don't realize uh, are, are, are statements that that uh, may be ignorant. And so then we say questions like, well, what am I missing? Or give me an example of, of racism today. And these are questions that I see. And so the biggest roadblock to Christians, and I'm, I'm talking to white Christians now, um, but I'm, I'm saying that a lot of it is, is that we need to learn and we need to listen and just listen openly. Uh, Pastor Andre uh, gave a great uh, overview of the history at our first talk, and there's some points here where he and I were, were, were talking about saying, okay, this is, uh, help me understand this because I heard something different, and he, and he laid out the facts. And then you have to process that through. So the roadblock, I think, is assuming that we know things that we don't know. It's just jumping to that assumption and saying, okay, well, there's no problem. Well, maybe there is, and let's, 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 let's figure out what that is and, and have that, that dialogue. So fear is the key, but fear can be overcome by courage as well as education. I, my apologies, but I wanna go back on the question regarding the bad apple. There's a couple of points I wanted to bring up I think it's important because most of the community are not aware of it, but when a complaint is lodged against an officer, the Florida statutes dictate the process by which we must investigate. It's called the, it's under chapter 112, it's called the Florida Police Officers Bill of Rights. So there's certain processes that must be followed in order for us to properly investigate the allegation made against the officer, especially if it is potentially going to result in some type of formal disciplinary action taken against the employee. And one of those things is, of course, you got to gather all the evidence, the witness statements, and present that to the officer prior to interviewing him or her. So essentially, you lay out all your evidence that you have against him or her. They have an opportunity to go through that and review it before you are allowed to conduct your interview. So let's move forward and pass that, and let's say now that there is discipline, you are going to state that the employee sustained violation of policy and that results in the level of discipline to be imposed. There is a process by which they can appeal and then in some agencies like ours we have a union and there's binding arbitration. So when you go through the whole process, you serve the employee the notice of intent, you give them the discipline, they serve the discipline, there's still processes by which they can appeal to include arbitration. And you all understand what arbitration, binding arbitration, is all about. But aside from that, depending on the nature of the allegation, if sustained, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement requires that those investigative facts be presented to them. They are the governing body that certifies law enforcement. And if it is 
one a violation that falls under their moral turpitude conduct, they then, in addition to the agency, takes action against the certification of the law enforcement officer, which could be is, uh, recommending that they, um, or they, they agree with the level of discipline imposed by the agency, or it could be all the way up to revoking the law enforcement officer's certification, and then he or she could no longer be a law enforcement officer. So it's not necessarily just the agency, right, that does their processes. There's a statute that requires certain things to happen, and then FDLE has mandates and requirements from the agency to send them for their review to look at whether or not there's additional sanctions that must be imposed against the officer certification. I just wanted to throw that out there and be a little more clear. Thank you, Chief Prince. Thank you. We've gone over about five minutes, so we're going to take one more question um, off of the uh, uh, online comments. What is the role of anti-racism in the community and Christianity? Is appropriate terminology or short-sighted? I think we've stooped him. Hmm. Want to try? I'm just trying to piece together the terminology a little bit. Well, let me just Wait, jump in here. You know, I what, think, is, what, yeah, is, what is yeah, that? Well, the, first of all, if we take the, the prefix anti, anti simply means against, right? If you're anti something, you're against it. So I think that the phrase ism is the problem here, racism. We, we, certainly we are against racism, right? What is the role of anti-racism racism in the community? Well, there's not a role, I would say. Anti-racism is, is, is it's saying you're against racism. Well, if we define racism as sin, right? And, and we, we start there. Well, the role is to call out sin when we see it. So how then do we identify sin? I would say we come back to the great commandment. To love your neighbor as yourself, right? To love God, to love your neighbor as yourself. As a Christian, I look at that and I say, wait a minute, did I just build up my neighbor? Did I just love my neighbor? Or did I just short my neighbor? Did I just insult my neighbor? Did I just degrade my neighbor? Did I just uh, cancel my neighbor? You see, I think we have to get to the granular level of relationships, of human relationships, that says within the community, are we building people up or are we actually tearing them down? Um, so the, the terminology anti-racism, uh, if it means, in my opinion, calling out sin, sin, then that's one thing. If it becomes political, though, and we're looking for political remedies, well, that's outside of my pay grade. So I, I, I would actually, you know, uh, default to Andre. What do you think? <laughs> I'm a pastor, not a politician. That's right. <laughs> God bless y'all. Y'all have a tough role. It's like pastoring secular people, hurting cats. <laughs> Man, I just uh, I thought we had a tough role. But um, the terminology, I, I, I get the terminology, but just as um, Dr. Smith said, if it's sin, it's sin. What is the name of it? It's pride. The refusal to um, be obedient to God in regards to the second commandment. That's really what the root issue is. And so when we talk about loving your neighbor, um, if you are entrenched in your ways, then you're being prideful. And pridefulness, just to help you know, some of my postmodern relativists out there, um, every sin isn't the same. There are six things that the Lord hates. Yes, seven. And the number one of them is <laughs> pride, a proud look. It is the chief sin of a Christian. That's what got Lucifer kicked out of heaven was pride. And so that, the, the reason why it has to be called out as such is because of the, the graveness in regards to um, its impact on the person's soul. And so what is the antithesis of um, pride? Humility. People are in here, hey, we just want to learn. I, I may be, have been raised a specific way, but let me hear your perspective. There may be a crossfire, but that doesn't mean I can't get up from the table, shake hands, and I won't smoke a cigar. I might think about it, but I won't do it. 
<laughs> but I want to stand up and, 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 let's, and let's hear these things out because I think that you become more well-rounded as a result of that. And so I think sin needs to be called out for what it is, um, but we also need a root name. There's a lot of modern words that's going on. You don't see racism in the Bible, but God did address it. He addressed it on the cross. He addressed it on the cross in the form of humility. And so I think that it's important that people are humble enough to listen. You may have your perspective, but if you are a Christian, not just a Christian, a nominal one that, you know, goes to church every now and then, and you like the Christian folk, but at home you're a different person. I'm talking about a real born-again person that really does believe that this Bible is authoritative in your life, then you do what the scripture tells you to do. Love your neighbor as you would yourself. That's, that's really the, the, the answer. It may be hurtful, it may be painful, but if you really want to please God, then you have to be obedient to him. All right, I think we're going to go ahead and pull a stop since we're going over here. We do have one more conversation, as some most of you know, uh, in uh, two weeks from today. It's going to be at Willow Creek Church, uh, same time, uh, 6 p.m. at night, and it's going to be right there in their sanctuary. So we appreciate Drew and Pastor Kevin and all their staff uh, hosting us for that evening. Uh, I know there's some more questions we have. Maybe we can address those at that point um, and uh, try to pull together some of them. I know maybe some repetition there and try to hit on the biggest topics that we have. But I uh, appreciate you guys being here tonight. Appreciate everybody that's watching online. Uh, give a big hand for this uh, uh, panelist and our, our panel up here. And uh, Chief Cranch, you want to make one more comment? Yeah, I do. I just want to, another quick final comment. I was sitting here thinking, you know, going back earlier on things we talked about, about building trust and having those relations in the community. But from a police perspective, there's so much that we do each day, but there's so much more that we can do in law enforcement, not just locally, but nationally. And I think one of the most important things is that we continue to make sure that our workforce mirrors our communities. Okay? That's the most critical thing that we can do in our law enforcement world. And I'm proud to say that since I come here, we have done that here in the city of Castleberry. We have increased the diversity of our workforce to mirror that in our community, and we're going to continue to do that. We're going to continue to have diversity in our workforce, not just by race, but by thought, diversity of thought, because diversity of thought makes us better, makes us stronger. And it comes from the heart that even makes it better. When you sit there and you talk to the individuals that I have the pleasure of talking to when I'm hiring them, it's evident to me that their hearts are in the right place and they're gonna make our community stronger, make our community better, and seek those opportunities to bridge those gaps. And again, the best way we can do it is to ensure that we listen and that we mirror our community and listen to our community every single opportunity that we have. Thank you, Chief France. Thank you, Pastor Andre. Thank you, Pastor Jonathan. I'm going to say a prayer and then I'm going to dismiss you guys. Thank you so much again for being here. Let's pray. God, we just thank you tonight for your presence and for your love and for the mind of Christ that is ours, the wisdom that we have shared with each other, the experiences that we have shared, the questions that have been raised, and we have done our best, Lord, to give answers. And I know, Lord, that in all the information that's been shared and all of the wonderful perspectives that have come from our panelists and the questions that have been raised uh, through our online audience, Lord, there's got to be a nugget. There's got to be some wisdom. There's got to be something that each one of us can take that we heard that will help us to now go out and live as people who will be part of the solution, part of reconciliation, part of, Lord God, blessing one another, loving you and loving each other in the way that Christ has taught us to. Uh, Lord, truly the antithesis is you uh, of all of these problems that we see, living for you, loving through you, and allowing your love to spread to this world through us. We ask you, Lord, to now go with us. Bless us, protect us, and Lord, help us, we pray, to have the mind of Christ and the love of Christ in the relationships that we have and in all of those that we come into contact with that we might, Lord God, see in every person that we meet uh, a potential child of the living God and someone that we can share his love and his grace with. Thank you for being with us here tonight. Be with us again in two weeks as we, Lord, talk about where do we go from here. We pray that you will continue to open our understanding and our hearts in all of these things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Thank you for coming. God bless every one of you.